Sometimes it feels like the sun will never rise, like the birds will never sing. That's right. When you don't know what to do, just keep on breathing. From the city of Los Angeles and the Big Apple in New York City, welcome to all my listeners out there in Radio Land. I'm Dave, the caregiver's caregiver at caregiverdave.com, along with my lovely co-host, Adrian Gruberg. And she looks like Dale Evans today, the way she's dressed. Looks like a wrangler and a cowboy and an American. <laughs> and uh, we are coming to you live and on demand 24-7 on 20, I don't know, 29, 30 global audio video Platforms including iHeart, Radio, iTunes, YouTube, Facebook, SoundCloud, just all over the world. And we're so proud to be voted number one caregiver podcast on the top 50 on Player FM and one of the six best podcasts by Caring.com, as well as number three podcast by thousands <laughs> on Feedspot. And I'm a little out of sorts today because one of my computers ain't working, so I'm just kind of... Going by the seat of my pants, as they say. I don't know where they got that expression from, but maybe because I feel a little hot uh, on my bottom. <laughs> but we do have an exciting show planned for you today, don't we, Adrian? Yes, we do. Talk louder so we can hear yes, you well. Yes, we do. <laughs> good, good, good. We have Ken Stern. And Ken, uh, I'm going to have him introduce himself, but he's he's a real important guy, and he is... Um, a member of a very important group, which I put in the uh, heading there. And But before I start that, I want to thank my last week's guest. Uh, and you can listen and watch that show uh, on all of our many global platforms that I just mentioned or our membership caregiver site, caregiverdave.com. Well, enough of that. Um, welcome to the show, Ken. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Adrian. Hi. Uh, nice like, to be with you guys. Like, well, Me thank too. you. The, the honor and the pleasure is ours. And I usually like to ask people, uh, you know, who's Ken Stern and why was he put on this earth? And also take the opportunity, because I usually introduce my guests, but today I'm I'm negligent. So just introduce yourself also. Give a nice uh, intro. I'll let you do it. And then tell us who is Ken Stern and why was he placed on this earth? Yeah, that's a that's a big question, Dave. Well, uh, thank you for this is a big show, Ken. Cool. We got uh, yeah. big shoes to fill here. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, wh who's Ken Stern? Why was I put on the earth? Um, uh, Tell us who you are first. Your your brief bio. Oh, all right. And then so, we'll go into the uh, personal. So I'm the host. So relevant to this um, interview, I'm the host <laughs> of a podcast from Stanford Center on Longevity on Caregivers. Oh. When I'm 64, the story of caregivers. I love that song, by the way. In fact, I've been singing it ever since you, when yeah, I get yeah. old and losing my hair. I'm not going to say Many not years not. from now, yeah, yeah. Many will years you still be sending no me a right. valentine? Goodness gracious, bottle of wine. And so on. But go ahead. Sorry for the interruption. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, uh, that's, uh, thank you for that addition. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that's that's who I am. I'm a long time uh, media guy, spent time at NPR, spent time oh. at my own company, uh, uh, and now work on longevity issues with the Stanford Center on Longevity in this podcast. And uh, I think, you know, why I was put on the earth, uh, if you want that hard question, uh, upstairs is my 13-year-old son, and, and not too far away from me is my 92-year-old mother, and uh, wow. up there wrangling votes in Pennsylvania is my, uh, I won't mention how old she is, my wife. So you uh, really are a caregiver. I am. Yeah, yeah. You're not just um, someone who, who says, well, I did it at one time or I studied it in school. And I, I, you not only have one person you're caring for, you have multiple people. Yeah, so I'm right there in the sandwich generation, right? So I have the young the Some young call kid. it the uh, club sandwich. <laughs> club sandwich, yes, I'm part of that club. Uh, yeah, so that's been my life for the last 13 years. Um, uh, for better or for worse, mostly for better, I think. Uh, but that's uh, my story. And that's what you're sticking to. So yeah. you are um, the Stanford Center on Longevity Chair. And why don't you tell us why caregiving 
for its uh, – why did you start this podcast for caregiving, and how did you get that position that you're on? Oh, so uh, let me sort of step back. So, uh, did I make a mistake? Yeah, you you correct me. me. Thank you correct for that. Me. Yeah, no, okay. no. Uh, so uh, I'm a chair of uh, of something called the Longevity Project, which partners with the Stanford Center on Longevity, which is one run by a uh, professor at Stanford named Laura Carson. I see. Yeah, very good so, school, Stanford. Yeah. Uh, it is, and I don't want to take her job from her. So, uh, so I just make sure <laughs> well, maybe that. one day though. <laughs> I don't think I'm qualified, but uh, um, so the Stanford Center on Longevity, for which we produce this podcast, uh, was started. This is its a- first ever podcast, right? It is, yeah, yeah. And they're so, doing it on caregiving. What, what an honor, Adrian! Did you hear that? Yes, I did. It's well, finally. Reason. Well, tell us the reason. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, there's actually I'm trying two to stop interrupting you. By the way, my wife says Sorry. I have a bad <laughs> habit of interrupting and interjecting. So I'm she's, just she's not wrong, Dave. She's not wrong. <laughs> there's a tape um, on my lips now. Go ahead. Uh, so the Stanford Center on Longevity was started about a dozen years ago by this by Laura Carsonson um, to uh, on this uh, on the notion that um, longevity in some ways was the greatest achievement, one of the greatest achievements of the 20th century. Our lifespan has yeah. doubled over 120 years. Um, but in many ways, society has hatched, has not really changed to reflect the, the fact that we, mm-hmm. you know, we don't die at 60 anymore, um, uh, or most yep. of us don't. Um, you know, the retirement age of 65 was invented by Bismarck 140 years ago, <laughs> so our retirement age. Um, uh, but the reason um, uh, we focused this uh, on, on caregiving for two reasons, for our first podcast, which we launched a month ago, uh, one is... Um, because whenever the, sta- uh, the Center on Longevity figured out at some point, whenever they did something on caregiving, people flocked to it more than any other topic. Uh, really? The fact that, you know, there are 53 million caregivers out there and there's just not right. enough story- stories and content for them. Uh, and the second is, you know, this is such a, uh, an important year uh, for caregivers. Um, the pandemic has turned everything upside down. Yeah. Of caregivers and the challenges they face. And I think we really wanted to use this opportunity to engage not just in the storytelling, but like how do we might make life better in the future, if there is a future, um, for caregivers and their loved ones. Yeah, well, Adrian and I have always said that, you know, caregiving needs more press. You know, like the Alzheimer's Association, they've got so many people talking about it and opportunities to share. Money. And money, yes. (laughs) We mustn't forget that, so... Uh, this is a great start for caregiving because, you know, there are, got a third of the population are caregivers, and 30% of them actually die before their loved ones do. And if yeah. they all decided to go on strike, they would cripple <laughs> the medical industry. Uh, it would be amazing that, uh, that people are not talking about caregiving, but we're so appreciative that Stanford is doing it. So uh, are you the host? You said you're the host? I am the host. Yes. Wow. Um, so that's my. It's it's Stanford's first podcast and my first podcast. But I've been around podcasting for many years. And has it started uh, yet or not yet? It did. We launched a month ago with our first four episodes. Okay. Uh, and, and how does someone find that uh, podcast? Thank you for asking, Dave. Uh, you can <laughs> find it uh, in a number of always like ways. to check out the competition. You know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, Stanford uh, the Stanford Center on Longevity website www longevity.stanford.edu, or like your show, wherever podcasts are found on iHeartRadio or uh-huh. podcasts, you can find it when I'm 64. So uh, we have well, five I episodes look, out, and you know, we come out I every I look forward three. to hearing it. That's great. Yeah. And not because your competition. When, there is no competition. There are some people out there who say, no, 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 you can't do what I'm doing. Hey, we're all in the same boat. We're all helping caregivers. <laughs> Believe me, there's enough of them to help, and there's yeah, no, not enough of us to help them. So uh, thank you for doing what you do. I, we really, really appreciate it. And um, um, just, just want to think about the fact that the, you, Ken said there are 53 million caregivers. Today's election day. I think there's more. I, I think there's more too, but yeah. there was certainly more than 45.7 million. Yeah. Um, think about if we could swing the caregiver vote one way or another because we had a, ca- a candidate. Yeah, as a voting who- block, yeah. That's, yeah. A, that's a very valuable population. It, like it you- is. Go ahead. And, 
one of the, I think one of the challenges uh, for caregivers is a lot of caregivers don't conceive of themselves as they don't label themselves as caregivers, right? So they right. they're taking care of a, a elderly parent, but they're not using that term caregiving. That's actually shown up in a lot of our interviews for our podcast. Absolutely. So oh, yeah. it's really a and both a, a barrier. Well, how about the caregiver of, to the neighbor? You know, uh, right? Of course. Somebody sees their neighbor picking up a newspaper. He goes, "Hey, let me help you do that." You know, while he's taking it inside, he notices he's reaching for something. Hey, let me get that for you. Next yeah, thing you know, he's making breakfast for the guy. Next thing you know, he's taking him to doctor appointments. Next thing you know, he said, oh, my God, how did I become this guy's caregiver? He'll, and, be, uh, he'll be doing it for his neighbor, but he won't be identifying as a caregiver. Is that right, Ken? Right? That, that's probably right. I think that's what, uh, yeah, that, that's what we all think. But, you know, I, um, you know we're, we're very apolitical at, the, at Stanford, at the Center on Longevity, but, you know, this is actually the first campaign in which any of the candidates ever talked about caregiving. Yep. Never put forward a caregiving plan. So I think that's a, you know, I think that's a moment in which the political establishment say, hey, something's different now. Yeah. Um, we yeah. need to, to, um, to, to deal with it in some fashion because, you know, just the huge gaps in care in the country that have been exposed by COVID and the challenges that tens of millions of people face and take care of their loved ones. Mm -hmm. yeah. possible, and I, possible to ignore that from a policy basis going forward. Sure. And I'm so glad that both sides are talking about it. I mean, you know, Trump is talking about uh, uh, pre-existing conditions, you know, that's going to be a part of his plan. It's my goal to get to the White House, get to Congress to speak about the importance of caregiving in the next health care bill, what, whosoever yeah. bill it is, and whoever is in the White House. Yeah. It's an important part. And, um, yeah. Uh, I don't know if it was in Obamacare. Do you know, uh, Adrian? No, I don't think it was in Obamacare as such. I think it was one of those things that was that needed to be talked about and added. Yeah. Well, and, we'll and, and like we said, nobody was talking about it. And um, now that the pandemic has created, I, I'd be brave enough to say maybe the caregiving population has doubled temporarily because let's face it. If you're sick, if you're sequestered, people have issues anyway. All of a sudden, you're caring for somebody because you're there. You're not at work right. anymore. And so uh, Adrian and I have a lot of stories about our, the different guests we've had. I'm sure you have some. Would you mind sharing like one or two of uh, your caregiving stories that you've – I know you haven't had much time on the air, but uh, are you on weekly or daily? What's your uh, frequency? Uh, every, every three weeks. Oh, every three around. weeks. Yeah. So you, yeah, yeah. you've only okay. had like one show so far, right? No, no, we, we started with, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, we actually had five. So we started, we oh, produced for four for the release, and then one since then. Um, yeah, Any so, interesting um, stories you want to share? Yeah, sure. I, I mean, I can think of, <laughs> well, the one I'll start with, um, Harry and Ma Aunt Mary Ann Wittenberg, which I'm, I'm afraid has a sort of a sad ending. Um, don't, oh. don't want to sort of bring things oh, down, but uh, so... Uh, this was a, this was a, um, uh, but I think it's the nature of subject, right? So it's, yep. um, uh, this was an episode we did on technology and caregiving. Um, Harry had uh, ALS, um, confined to a wheelchair. Marianne, his wife, long, his wife of 45 years, was his caregiver. Uh, so we did an interview with them. Um, uh, beautiful people. Um, Harry, um, you know, having life had taken a difficult turn, but you've never met a more upbeat um uh, happy person and engaged and lovely to talk to. Um, it was a great interview, uh, and we were, you know, thrilled to share their story two weeks ago. But um, Harry passed away the weekend before the episode came out. Oh, took us a turn. We were able to share the story with him, you know, just before he died, um, uh, and happy to do that. But we were sort of you know, sad about the sort of timely demise of of Harry. Um, it was a beautiful story, and I hope it's meaningful for others when they listen to it. Sure. And what kind of response have you been getting from your podcast? Uh, you, you've got uh, – it's not video, right? It's just audio? Just audio, yeah. Yeah. Um, good. How are you I, out there broadcasting on, on what kind of platforms and the, and the number of them, and, and how do people contact you or respond to your shows? Yeah, so you can um, – so we're on, you know, uh, all, all the typical platforms like Apple and iHeartRadio and, and Stitcher and all, all of them, and through Stanford and, and our own Longevity Project website. Um, uh, but we've heard from a lot of listeners. I mean, I think, you know, one of the, I think one of the beauties of both radio and uh, podcasting is such a personal medium. And, right. 
I think the opportunity to connect with people is such an important part of this. So, you know, we've heard from people by email coming to the coming to Stanford and putting up comments there. Um, uh, and I've had a chance to connect with some of our listeners since then. So, mm-hmm. you know, we're just starting. Um, we haven't been around for a while like you guys. Uh, so um, we're just glad to be able to sort of contribute to, to the dialogue and hopefully build a little bit of community around uh-huh. our story. Now, why they pick you? What's your background? Uh, how do you qualify for this very important position? <laughs> yeah, uh, poorly, probably. Uh, so, uh, uh, like I said, I was with uh, I was at NPR, although not in a broadcast. I was there for this launch of uh, NPR's podcast when I ran NPR um, many years ago. So I've sort of been around the beginning of podcasting. I've been, I've so this is not your first rodeo. Uh, no, I've been around for a while. Let's put it that way. Okay. That's, uh, uh, as, as your listeners can see, I've been around for a while. So, um, you know, and I've been partnering with the Stanford Center on Longevity for a little over a year now on a variety okay. of issues, um, uh, and decided to collaborate on this on this podcast. And it's been well, fun, it's, exciting, and hard. Right, this is hard stuff. It is hard stuff, and uh, you're up to the challenge because you've got the experience, and you're a caregiver. And I mean, what else do you need? You know, caregivers know what caregivers are going through. Um, yeah. if, if I only knew me when I became a caregiver, when my wife had a stroke, man, I'd be in much better shape. But, uh, you know, I wasn't around. A lot of places wasn't around. The Internet wasn't around. Oh. Uh, we, we had to travel 20 minutes to some hospital to go to a support group. And, uh, you know, and and things are just... Face-to-face yeah. face is very difficult for some people. They can't leave yeah. the house. Yeah. <laughs> That's the beauty of a podcast, of course, is that... Caregivers can listen when they actually have a chance to listen. Yeah. And yeah. so, uh, I mean, but I'll tell you, so my, I mean, my, so, so I, you know, I first started being involved, I guess, in caregiving when my dad had a stroke, you know, he's oh. since passed, um, a decade mm-hmm. ago, maybe more. Um, and I've, I feel like every, I mean, one of the things that interests me is that everything felt handcrafted, right? You were just sort of on your own trying to figure things out, everything yes. was new. Um, and I think that's, a, that's true for a lot of people. I mean, even to this day, even sure. with the rules of the internet and podcasts like yours, um, I just think it's it's really hard for people. Um, it feels like you're inventing everything over again every time. So I think that's the um, the challenge that uh, caregivers face, and hopefully, you know, we as a community can help them a bit. Yes. Well, listen, we're going to take a short break, but don't worry, we'll be right back. But don't. <laughs> Go away. Dave Nassani, the caregiver's caregiver, has just released his sixth book entitled It's My Life Too, Thrive to Stay Alive as a Caregiver. It was specifically written for caregivers who know they should be putting their needs first, but just don't know how. Dave is the sole caregiver to his wife, Charlene, since 1996. He knows firsthand what caregivers are going through because he is one. He now speaks all across the country, offering caregivers his amazing caregiver support package. Even the airlines tell us that in the event of an emergency, to put your oxygen mask on first before you help your child with their mask. They know that those who don't heed their advice often black out, thus becoming unable to help either themselves or their child. And caregivers are exactly the same way. It's my life too. Thrive and stay alive as a caregiver will help caregivers who are neglecting their sleep, diet, and social life and learn to put their needs first. Pick up your copy today or buy one for your special caregiver on sale everywhere and at caregiverdave.com. And we're back with Ken Stern. I'm Dave Nassani on the Caregiver Dave Show and my lovely co-host, Adrian Gruberg. And uh, I wanted to ask you, Ken, now since we've um, come into the pandemic, what... What different problems, I guess you can't really compare them to because you came into this, into the uh, pandemic, but is is burnout a big problem for caregivers? I mean, I know it's a silly question, but from your experience, how have you found uh, the health of these caregivers? Uh, How bad are they? I mean, are they they worse than they were before the pandemic? Uh, I'm sure they've given you some background on their stories. Yeah, well, I think we're all a little bit worse uh, since the pandemic, <laughs> uh, but worse for wear. 
Uh, but I think it's particularly hard uh, for caregivers, and I think the data will show that up. I mean, we already know even before the care uh, for the pandemic, as as I know you and your yeah. listeners already know, you know the financial, physical, psychological toll that caregiving exacts on people. Um, yeah. We just know how much life has gotten harder. I, you know, I mean, we've just been told by a lot of folks, you know, the the, the increasing cost of social social isolation, not just on you know on the caregivee but on the caregivers um you know the physical toll uh i think this is going to exact a price on the country for for many years even yeah, trust that yeah oh. um do you have a personal story about burnout i mean you've shared just a little bit about you know your frustrations when you first became a caregiver um what what were some of the events that led to your burnout and what could you have done to have prevented it yeah, you know, I'm assuming that you got burned out because we all do. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, I actually, um, I, uh, I'm sitting here right now in my basement and I'm listening to my son, <laughs> my 13 year old son, thud above me. You know, I think my worry is okay. less about myself, um, but <laughs> about my family. You know, that kid is, you know, at, at sort of such a formative age and he's stuck upstairs in the house for the last seven months and barely left the couch. Uh, you know, I think this whole generation. Not back to school. He's going to school virtually. No, virtually. They're they're not. We're what in state DC. are you in? We're in DC. Yeah, so they're not. Uh, not they actually. Yeah. So right. Not how's that? State. How's that working out for you? <laughs> um, well, uh, uh, that's well, a, I should that's say a for him. Style. Yeah, it's a different. Show. So, so they were actually the DC because uh, they're not ready and aren't ready and schools physically aren't ready so i think it's exacting a huge toll on him and um you know, i think my burnout is on his behalf and my 92 year old mother uh, has declared she's never leaving the house again so uh, <laughs> because she's consumed with fear yes i've got uh, fear it's hard those, i haven't seen my daughter in almost a year and her husband really? and my grandchildren they live in ventura not very far from me um but uh now he he ventured out the other day and he says, I'm coming to see you because um, he's yeah. less fearful than she is. She's yeah. fearful for him, but he just says, you know what? I'm going. But, and, yeah. you know, we, we met outside and uh, we had masks on. And then after a while, we took our masks off because I don't know why we felt comfortable. Uh, we we went to lunch uh, or we brought the food back. And, and it was great seeing him. And he... Uh, you know, you don't realize how much you miss that personal touch. I mean, these are our kids. We're used to seeing them constantly. And they're yeah. adults now, you know, grown uh, in their 50s. But uh, I tell you, it's it's tough. It's tough, and it needs to end. And I'm glad that, uh, you know, science and the medical uh, industry is doing what they can do. Project, what do they call it? Project uh, Warp Speed or something Warp like speed. that? Warp yeah, Speed, well, yeah. Hope so. We'll find out. <laughs> yeah. Can't go on think, forever think, because we're Americans, by golly, and we just won't well, allow it. We, we, we uh, know, we know the vaccine won't be ready by election day. That's one thing we know now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. That is that is right. That, that's for sure. Yeah. The um, <laughs> uh, I you know uh, I'll hope with you and pray with you all that uh, this will will get a cure or a vaccine soon. Yeah. Uh, but I think the. You know, I think the consequences of this or the psychological costs are going to go on. I mean, you know, well, and it's not just we'll that; it's the the unrest, the the riots, the looting, uh, the peaceful protests. <laughs> uh, there are so many things on our plate besides caregiving, and I, we don't even know what the suicide rate is. We just know that it's very high. And I just gave a, a talk about six, seven months ago. That was before the uh, pandemic, uh, over a year ago about how uh, suicide uh, people, caregivers are very susceptible to suicide. Uh, a survey was done at AARP and the United uh, um, Hospital Fund, I think it was. Uh, they did a survey of uh, 1,677 caregivers, found that roughly half of them felt down, depressed, and hopeless just two weeks prior to the survey. Now, those are the same symptoms that, you know, uh, Anthony Bourdain and Kate Spade and Robin Williams all feel just before they they took their life. So it's it's serious. And uh, like you had mentioned, uh, we may not know for a while how this, uh, the toll that this has really brought upon us. Um, what What's your opinion of um, 
what caregivers can do during the pandemic to just, um, I, I don't want to say survive or hang in there, but yeah. to thrive. Because look at you, you're, you got a smile on your face. You're, uh, how old are you now? I'm 57. Yeah, see, so you don't look like you're 80, like some 57-year-olds do. Uh, I've seen people age. I remember watching Jimmy Carter when he was president. He was he was young. His hair was, and by the time at the end, man, the guy aged 20 years. It's stress does that, and caregivers are like that too. But you well, must be doing something doing. right because you've got a smile on your face. You're kind of upbeat. You're you're real calm and and uh, melanch melancholy. What's your secret, and how how can you tell all these other people who are freaking out? To, yeah, uh, I think be more I like fake you. it for podcasts. Yeah, I fake it for podcasts. I think it's my secret. <laughs> but uh, but you know, I think I it's um, you know, I, I don't have uh, um, I, I have no secrets to provide. I think it's you know, I'll say the most uh, obvious things, which is caregivers deserve deserve respite as much as anyone else, and need to find time for themselves. Um, uh, one of the actually the first uh, episode of our podcast was an uh, interview with Seth Rogen, the actor, and his wife. Uh, oh, wow. That's a pretty a good fun. interview. Yeah, it was fun. The Stanford um, name. Uh, that's right. Uh, <laughs> um, they've uh, they've but, been very active in caregiving, right? They have been. Her her mother had Alzheimer's, also early onset Alzheimer's, um, but they have a foundation which provides respite care, and so we yes. had a chance to talk about the importance of respite. And actually, Seth uh, said told a funny story at the end. Um, that you know, he knew it was worth it when someone came up to an airplane and said they were uh, on a, on their first respite uh, provided by his foundation. Uh, <laughs> oh, first wow. time off, given in a year. Oh, uh, good for uh, Seth. Good for Seth. Beautiful story. Yeah, yeah. He talks it, about it on talk shows all the time now, and yeah. it's wonderful to hear caregivers yeah. being spoken about on a show that you know people just tune in to be entertained. And this was just pure information, and I loved it. He's he's yeah. very happy doing it. Awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. No. And I said, and I think you know they've lived it, so they uh, they have something to offer, and I think that's a beautiful thing. Yep. And right now we're talking about um, companies and uh, corporations and and organizations starting to see get it that there are caregivers that are working for them, and they're starting to cater. Uh, tell me what you know about. Um, the progress that uh, corporate America is uh, having for taking care of these caregivers. Yeah, so I think there's actually two interesting trends going on in corporate America, uh, one of which is the beginning of understanding that caregivers um, need time off for their role as well. I mean, we saw a trend uh, where big companies began to understand the importance of largely about parents uh, taking care of their kids, and I think we're beginning to see the, the the, the, the first inkling um, that um, caregiving for older relatives is equally important and um, uh, critical to many of their employees and to their success as employees. Uh, so you begin to see some policies for that. Um, the other interesting thing I think is, and we're going to do an episode on this so it's on my mind, is that you know, there are 53 million caregivers and companies are being understand this as a marketplace, uh, which I think yeah. is a big thing because it means more services, more opportunities, more products for caregivers to take advantage of. One of the episodes where we haven't even started uh, um, booking, it, but we're going to do is on innovation and caregiving. Um, there's a group called TechStars, which you may have heard of. It's a mm -hmm. uh, regional incubator in Silicon Valley for companies, and they did their first, they're in the middle right now, of their first caregiving incubator. So 10 companies who think are only focused on caregiving coming together to sort of innovate and launch. Um, and I think that's really cool. Incubator? Explain that. Yes. Yeah, so an incubator. Incubator yeah. is a think tank, right? Yeah, so so um, uh, traditionally it's actually a physical place where you bring... Yes. For babies. Tanks. Premies. Right. Well, well, that's right. I know so, what it is. So these are baby companies. Um, so it's, it's, that's, that's exactly right. So you bring oh. sort of 10 startup companies together, or some number, and you spend You're speaking time... speaking figuratively, time. okay. I thought you meant... Um, they're making incubators for caregivers. I said, oh, really? Well, how can I use that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm a literalist, you say. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. So, um, <laughs> And so they're doing it now. Of course, it's not physical location, but they're working with 10 sort of promising startup 
shadows okay. for caregivers. Yeah. And that's sort of where you live. And I think that's a big problem because it's recognizing you know, corporate America sometimes runs ahead, yeah. especially the innovators. Yeah, cap run capitalism ahead. works. Free market yeah. always will meet the need. I have a question that's about that. Yeah. I mean, yes. The technology can be expensive and caregivers notoriously don't have a lot of loose cash around to to spend even on, you know, if they did, they might have respite people come in that they pay and they don't do that. Right. So what, do you have any idea what kind of, you know, money, Aid. financial point this is going to be marketed at? Yeah, so I don't know. We haven't done the episode yet. Um, but I think it's a really good question, Adrian, right? So it's, uh, it, it's, I mean, there's a lot of barriers around technology. One is cost. One is knowing how to use it. One is right. knowing where it is. One is getting support for it. I mean, there's all right. sort of those. It's a whole continuum of uh, of things that keep um, keep caregivers from getting the use of the best technology. So I think you know one of the things I'm interested in asking. I think and I'm glad you asked this. Is you know um, asking these companies like how do you think about accessibility of this technology? How do you know? It's no good if you do it. Um, it's not much of a business for them. Uh, how do you either work with insurance companies or, or, or you know, Medicare, yeah. Medicaid? Yeah, you know, insurance companies have those, to be a part of that. Yeah, so I think those are really sort of important questions yeah. because you know, it's a tree fall in the woods if no one can afford it. That's why we have to <laughs> talk to people at the White House and Congress because it's got to start at the top, trickle down. So you talk about longevity. How are caregivers uh, feeling about their longevity, and um, uh, how are they doing? Are they living less because they're caregivers? Are they dying sooner? Yeah, well, you, you're the one, uh, uh, Dave, you said, uh, I think quite correctly, yeah. um, that 30% of caregivers predecease yeah, their... I answered my own question. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, one of the reasons, so the, the, the one thing I would add to it is, uh, I mean, longevity is real, and you know it's changing. You know, one of the reasons we picked the "When I'm 64" song, not only because right. it's a great song, but because you know when they wrote it, 64 was old. Uh, 64 was the age. Not at old to you me. You start getting care. Yeah. That's right. And yeah. now you can be 64, and you can be a caregiver, um, as much as likely you're a care more likely than you're caregiving. So it's changed. You know how we think about things in half century. Yeah, and I'm 66 now, so I've been. Uh, you know, I was supposed to get my. Social Security, and they're saying, well, you know, you should really wait till you're 70 because you could put more away and this and that. And when I get to be 70, then they'll be telling me 75. I mean, everything is just going out further and further. I never thought I would get Social Security because when I was younger, I knew it would be bankrupt by the time I was 65. But lo and behold, <laughs> they're not bankrupt yet. <laughs> Maybe next year. <laughs> but, but I think um, when you're 70, there'll still be money. Yeah. It was a widow. Yeah, they, they got a printing press. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I, say, I, I, I was a widow at 63. Hmm. You know, it's I, my husband, his cancer was six years in duration. And uh, that was, it was like 63. I'm a very young widow. And that's not <laughs> that, yeah. we just started a, uh, a group for young spouses, which which seems to be a new target audience of um, of people who are taking care of their spouses who are in their 30s and, and even 20s, you yeah. know, whether it's from car accidents or cancer or it doesn't, doesn't matter. Yeah. We're younger. And caregivers need to learn to stay young inside, you know, it, it's uh, young at heart. Because Adrian doesn't look her age, and I've been told that I don't, and you certainly don't. Uh, here we're, all pre we're preaching to the choir here, I know, but there's a whole audience out there who are listening to us and and are just, um, you know, worried. Um, I I spoke in Hawaii uh, the first time about three or four years ago, and realized that they have something called uh, the Kapuna Bill. Yes. Kapuna means uh, elder, you know, family member, caregiver, etc. And they, the legislate, the state legislature in Hawaii came up with a $2,500 um, respite fee that they will give to anyone who needs it. 
Now, of course, there were only so many. It was first come, first serve. Right. But, and you, you can still work also. So I, I thought that was a great model for a government, you know, to have this this fund of money. You know, it's almost like the AFLAC. Uh, here, here's the money. We don't care what you use it for. You know, it's just uh, – and let's face it. There's so much waste in government. They can figure out if they really put their mind to it where to get the money from and cut out the waste and and uh, just be more and more efficient. You know, that's the one thing I like about Trump is that he's a businessman. He knows how to cut costs and – Etc. Some people criticize him for cutting too much, but uh, the government is a business, and you need to treat it like a business, kind of, uh, as far as the the balance sheet goes. You know, I remember Reagan went in there and was finding that they were paying five hundred dollars for hammers, so lots of waste, and that money can be going to caregivers. And uh, we're not going to get political on this program, by the way. <laughs> right, but I think uh, so. So we won't get political, but I do think. Um, I mean, the notion, so you asked about the, talked about the Affordable Care Act um, and the importance of providing continuity of care. Um, you know, I think every, everyone understands, I think, much more than they did two decades yeah. ago that healthcare yeah. is a right, and that's, you know, caregivers are a big piece of that. And uh, yep. you know, that's a, a role for both the government and private sector in sort of solving that problem for all of us. I mean, the statistic is we save the government $450 billion a year. That's right. So, That's the least they can do is throw a little of that money back, you know. Or we will go on strike, by golly. <laughs> no, we, won't. we should, but we won't. Oh, yeah, let's start a union. Because who's going to take care of our loved ones if we do? They, they, they know. They just know. They know. It's too good to do that. But uh, maybe we need a union to negotiate on our behalf. <laughs> it's, it's hard for volunteers to go on strike. I think it's sort of one of the things that just don't, yeah. doesn't add up. But uh, yes. We have like a lot you. of volunteers at our at our church, and you know sometimes we don't get the best um, work out of them. But they say, well, "What are you going to do?" You know, because uh, no work is worse than mediocre work. Anyway, we're going to take a break. We're up on another break, so we will be right back. Don't go away. We are a community of caregivers that understands and supports you wherever you are in your journey. We are a place to connect with other caregivers. But more importantly, a place to get practical, actionable help. There are lots of ways for you to get support. First of all, you can download our welcome pack. This will get you started on your Thrive journey. Next, you can ask and get answers to your questions by posting them here in our private Facebook groups. You can also get live online support by attending one of our live Weekly Connect webinars. You can get practical, actionable advice by listening to our weekly podcast. You can hear and read other stories about other caregivers' experiences. Plus, add your own in our weekly Share Your Story forum, posted every Tuesday in the Facebook group. You can access essential resources and download practical Thrive Solutions Packs, all of which are geared to help you thrive as a caregiver. You can get lifetime access to all of our resources. Again, we're here to support you and help you thrive and to enjoy your life as a caregiver. And remember, this is a place to get hope, not just cope. And we're back on the Caregiver Dave Show. I'm Dave Nassani with my lovely co-host Adrian Gruberg and our guest today, Ken Stern. And... You know, Ken, there's, there's, there's a few caregiver podcasts out there. I mentioned them in the beginning of the show. And I did a lot of listening, which is why I want to listen to yours too, uh, because I love what they're doing. I love their hearts. It's in the right place. But a lot of them are just kind of boring. You know, they either let the guests go on and ramble, 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 and there's just a dialogue. I'm sorry, a monologue instead of a dialogue. So I, I think the best podcasts are the ones that, you know, have interesting guests, guests who are entertaining, guests who aren't just monotone, who put you to sleep. And the host, of course, has to be the same way. Um, so what what is your secret at your, um, at your podcast? What, what's your goal? What's your vision there? When you started it, what is it that you want to uh, do for the caregivers? What do you want them to learn, and how do you want to teach them? Yeah. So, uh, so there are two parts of our each of our episodes, um, uh, and actually look forward to to your guys' feedbacks. Uh, sure. Um, I really would. Um, <laughs> so, um, so there are really sort of two things. One is we wanted to let um, tell the story of caregivers. 
research and really find and produce carefully um, in sort of the NPR way. I mean, for 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 yes. those who know that, um, both you know, that's my background. It's my production team's background. Um, you know, so to produce uh, and let them caregivers tell their story in their own words. Um, and that's, you know, half the podcast. And the other half we wanted to use, look, the convening power of Stanford uh, and bring together, you know, real world, you know, global experts on the topic of the show and sort of speak to the challenge that the caregiver had laid out. And so that's yeah. what we do. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it, it sounds a little different. It's one of the reasons we only do it every three weeks because it's sort of how you uh, um, show. Yeah, so uh, it takes all of it, it takes all that time to produce it. Um, as you know, that's that's that does take time. But um, you know, we think it's worth it to be able to really allow the caregivers to sort of share their story in the best possible mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. So when you're not caregiving and you're not uh, working on the podcast, what are you doing? <laughs> so uh, uh, is there uh, is there other time? No, so, and you're not so, sleeping. Uh, Go ahead. <laughs> uh, so the podcast is actually part of uh, a, a broader embrace of issues around longevity called the Longevity Project, uh, where we uh, engage with you know, sort of a foster research and public conversation around the impact of longevity. So we have events. Mm -hmm. We have a huge conference coming up in December out in mm -hmm. virtual land. Uh, oh. Uh, um, you know, people can find and, and join for free uh, at longevity-project.com. And we'll have some of the people, you know, that we're talking about, like Bob Casey, who's going to, assuming the Democrats take back the Senate, will be the chair of the Senate Committee on Aging. He'll be the one uh -huh. probably most responsible for thinking about caregiving policy. So, mm -hmm. you know, Do we have a, a Senate Committee on Aging right now? We do. Yeah. Susan Collins from Maine is the chair. Um, See what happens to her today. Have they done uh, anything lately? <laughs> uh, I haven't heard of. So, uh, uh, I'll you, ask her. Make up her mind. <laughs> yeah, that's a good place to start. The, uh, uh, the committee on the center of what is it called? Committee on aging. Committee on aging. Yeah. So, it's a good place to start. <laughs> so, but, uh, go but ahead, aging. Not aging is not all about Alzheimer's. It you know we're talking about sure. longevity in terms of just people are living longer, so that everybody's lives are impacted by by that. It's it's not just it's not just about the Alzheimer's Association. <laughs> you know, so longevity is not even just about aging, right? So it's not you know people hear longevity and they think about the challenges of old age, and that's a huge part of it. But it's also how do we actually you know live a longer life fully, uh, and that's everything from how we educate ourselves to how we find you know to Dave's question about you know social security, how we finance these longer lives. There are yeah. big questions that are really you know, the the, sense the quality of, of life as opposed to right. quantity. That's right. Like if you take the Center on Longevity at Stanford. Um, which has about 200 affiliated faculty. The biggest uh, number of them are actually childhood experts. Mm -hmm. Consequence of early childhood education and health for healthy longevity is huge. So you know yes. these are these are issues of the full lifespan. Yeah, I spoke at the University of Hawaii at the Center of Aging over there, and um, she heard me speak, and she was so excited because she said, "Oh my goodness, three, four other things going on," and she got me in these other places to speak. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm no big deal. What, what's, what's, what are you impressed with? She goes, oh, you're the first real live caregiver that we've heard speak. Usually we get people who are majoring in, the, in aging and majoring in gerontology. And so there was a conference over there with uh, political, medical, and edu educational all come together. And they put me on the main stage, and I was sharing with all of them, just telling my story, you know, how I became a caregiver and, and what I do Please. now and how I help caregivers. Which category did they put you into? <laughs> the caregiver category. They says oh, sure. they said, yes. you know, caregivers is a big part of aging, and we have nobody speaking on caregiving. Not really, you know, other people who who maybe they're talking on gerontolo gerontology or or right. aging, but not specifically caregiving. So I I got the main stage and and they all enjoyed my story. It's not like you know I wasn't educated. I they have degrees and PhDs and theses and you know I just have a uh, a loved one that I care for, and they thought <laughs> sure. that that was just so refreshing, you know. And and uh, 
uh, I was on a panel also with six other people, and I was I was the last one, so I'm listening to all of them, and they're just kind of so dry and and no personality and just monotone and and I'm looking in the audience. Uh, most of the audience is over 60, 70, 80, and many of them are falling asleep. And I get in there and says, "All right, everybody, up! Let's we're going to do some calisthenics, <laughs> you know." And I I got them, you know, touching their toes and touching the sky and and you know I brought life back into their face. <laughs> And uh, I had their attention for the next uh, 20 minutes, 25 minutes, however long it was. And so, uh, you know, I think that people need to teach people how to talk to elders. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, I just came back from uh, Acapulco because I told you I was doing a, um, a storytelling conference. So lots of great tricks to keep people's attention because, let's face it, if you want caregivers to change, they have to hear you. They can't just tune out and say, oh, what's this guy want? You know, i I got to go to uh, pick up my laundry or something. So, um, so, so Dave, give me free advice. What, was, what, was the, what were your biggest tips for, for, caregiver, for storytellers? Uh, a very strong opening and a very strong closing. So, um, and always tell stories. Uh, yeah. People are always tempted to just give facts, 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 facts. Right. Well, people don't care about facts. Even the salespeople say, facts tell, stories sell. And think of yourself, uh, how, how many people you have listened to who you thought were interesting, and say, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I have this goal, this purpose. What, is, what good is it going to do to share a personal story about, you know, this dream that I had? Well, because people will listen to people who they like, and you have to seem genuine. You have to seem authentic. People won't care what you have to say until they see how much you care about them or something like that. It rhymes, but I'm, I'm doing it. You've heard it, right? About them. Well, we'll solve this with a Google after the show. Yes. So after, uh, so you're going to tell this story. So you look in the middle of the story, and that's the number one thing. You want to tell a lot of stories, you know, and then connect your stories together and then give the, the point at the end because you're not going to lose them. If you lose them in the beginning, they're gone. So you find the most dramatic, the most informative part of your story, which is usually somewhere in the middle, and you bring that to the front. And then you, you, you give it feeling. You, you let the people have a moment, uh, an experience where they connect. And they say, oh, my God, what, what happened next? And then you can go into your story to catch up. I mean, Hollywood does that, right? How many movies have you gone to? And the first scene in the movie is like maybe the end of the movie. Uh, Star Wars is very good about that. You know? And then they, they go backwards. And so that's, that's my advice to you. <laughs> that's good advice. I mean, I found that in in writing as well, not not just verbal verbal storytelling, but written storytelling. Grab them. <laughs> Great advice. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, you can think... mess with them too. You can you can fool around with them. You can yeah. you can say it in a way where they're going to expect you. You know, you're you're going to set yourself up, and then uh, they're going to expect you to say something, but you go in a totally different direction, and you say, ah. Oh, and that was funny. They got me. I was, I was right there. And then you took a right turn, and and uh, you know. I, you... I want to tell you a quick story. All right. <laughs> At the Roslyn Carter conference on on uh, caregiving last November, I was the last speaker. I was the only person there that made anyone laugh. <laughs> That's very important. And, you gotta laugh. And if you can, if you can make somebody laugh about caregiving, you're telling a good story. <laughs> yep. And we so, actually have an episode on humor. Coming out. Yeah, we have an episode on humor coming out. I mean, so, well, so good, good, uh, good. Dave, you're pre you guys both are preaching to the choir because I really believe yeah. in sort of power. <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm about. And uh, I believe in it so much that you know, so many people tell me I'm funny. I make people laugh all the time. And so someone sell, told me, well, you should do stand-up, improv. And that's scary because you're up there and now you got to make them laugh or they're going to, like, throw things at you. But I had an opportunity to do improv when I was in New York. I, uh, it was an event at the New York uh, Harvard Club. And I was supposed to just stand up and tell a joke. But I said, you know what, this is my opportunity. I crossed this on my bucket list. I listened on the Internet for as many jokes as I could that actually made me laugh not just smile or chuckle. I wrote them down. I intervened them and weaved them into personal stories. And I did a um, four-minute comedy set. And everybody laughed. And it was good. 
because that's that's the kind of practice you have to have. Yeah. You gotta, when the curtain goes up, you got to be on, you know, because you never know. Hey, uh, Ken, why don't you come up and share a few things? Uh, what? What? Huh? Me? <laughs> Right. Well, I felt that when you asked me why I was put on Earth this, uh, um, at the beginning of the show. So <laughs> see, uh, I'm ready, ready for stuff like that. But I didn't have so, any jokes. So I, I think I well, that's okay. Um, you look like a very funny guy. I'm sure your wife says you're a funny, very funny guy or funny-looking guy or something. I don't know. But <laughs> what? Uh, <laughs> I'm, we, that's just caregiver humor. <laughs> And uh, I can tell you're a very humble guy. You, you, you're giving a lot of self-deprecating uh, jokes. You know, you're always like putting yourself down, and and that's a form of humor as well. Very so, accomplished, though. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I wish I uh, worked for uh, NPR. That's a great. Uh, you've got a wonderful resume, and now you've got another one here associating yourself with Stanford. Good for you. Um, I've got a great guest for you, by the way, who talks about uh, financial aid. Her name is Camille Superson, and I'll share that contact with you later. She's so good. She's been on my show like three or four times, and I never have anybody on my show more than once, usually. That's so but, much information. But she's, she's got this encyclopedia that she wrote, and she keeps updating and updating. Free food, free money, free government organization, uh, state, local, um, IR, um, yeah, IRS tax credits, uh, Social Security, veterans, you name it. She has figured out how to get money out of the government and how to get free food and stuff like that. So she'd be a great guest on your show, and the exposure great. would be certainly good for her. But uh, in the last few minutes of the show, I think we got about three or four minutes, what would you like to talk about that I haven't discussed with you yet? And then we'll talk about uh, how people can get a uh, hold of you and and uh, find your podcast, et cetera. So I, I think I don't know that I've uh... – anything more to offer uh you know we're just getting into this and you know it's, <laughs> it's, it's the beginning for us um what i would love you know to actually a point you both made would love to hear from people about the you know the issues they're concerned and want to hear more about and the stories um you know we started the podcast saying there are 53 million caregivers and mm -hmm. there are 53 million stories so you know find those stories and hearing from folks and uh it's something yeah. that would be incredibly helpful for us so um just appreciate that opportunity to, to to say that. And six million of them are between the ages of eight and eighteen. Yep. So these are kids that maybe are uh, forget about the pandem pandemic, but before that, you know, they were staying at home because there was no one else to watch grandma. They were missing school. They're working these long hours. They're not covered under the uh, labor laws of their state. Uh, a lot of people don't even know about them because they're unreported. It's like. Uh, nobody wants to report that that I'm keeping my kid home from school because I have no one else to watch grandma. I mean, there's, yeah. there's a lot of stuff going on. That's an incredible story, yeah. Again, uh, how do we find your podcast? The simplest way. Is it just simple to just simpler to Google um, a couple of words and that will take us there? So you can uh, – I'll give you a bunch of different words. So All right. uh, the podcast. Is when I'm 64, the story of caregivers, and I think okay. if you Google that, you'll get there. Um, really? Or the Stanford okay. Center on Longevity. Stanford. Uh, so, and you will find our podcast on their website as well. So if I just put in when I'm 64, comma, Stanford, that'll get me there, right? That should get you there. Uh, that should I'm not get sure if I've okay. done quite that. Longevity. We could throw that word in there too, right? Yeah. yeah. Longevity. That'll increase the odds. With me, it's just Caregiver Dave, and you'll find me. Is that right? Those are yes. Easy. Yeah. What is your the website, the full website name? I know it's a long one. It's www.longevity.stanford.edu. Longevity.stanford.edu, as in education. That is exactly right. All right. And if somebody wanted to actually email you, they could email you through the website. You'd get it? Yep. You can do that. And also... Um, uh, I mentioned earlier our conference coming up. Uh, yeah. In December, oh yeah, tell me about that. Everyone, um, it's the virtual four one. days. Anyone can dive four days. In. Yeah, yeah. From when uh, to when? December ninth to December fifteenth, with some days in between. Nine to fifteen. Yeah. And you can find us the same way through the either. So it's on your website, advertising it, etc. Yeah. Yeah. It's so mark that on your calendar. I'm, I'm going to try to do that. Folks. Really? Yeah, we'd love it if you come. You can register. On it, uh, the registration links will be on um, on the website. So we'd love it uh, if you and everyone else came. 
Awesome. Adrian, uh, how do we get a hold of you again? As if I didn't know. <laughs> As if you didn't know. Yes, it's Adrian at thecaregiverspace.org. And all of the social media links and whatever are un under that. And the chats are on <laughs> Facebook, which is, right. you know, the caregiver space. All right. And I'm caregiverdave.com. Uh, we have a Facebook page, Caregiver Dave. We have a YouTube channel. We have uh, everything, Pinterest, uh, Twitter, <laughs> uh, Instagram. We're all over the place. Yes, you And uh, we're giving away th uh, three free gifts if you join our membership website. It's it's really inexpensive. It's not a yearly fee or a monthly fee. It's, it's a fee for life. It's such a tiny little fee. If you ever go to the hospital because 30% die, but many more become sicker than their loved ones, have to go to the emergency room, and they eventually need a caregiver of their own. They're, they're not coming home. So uh, stress is what kills, and a support group is what reduces the stress, and we like to think that we help them thrive and not just survive caregiving, because who, who could survive just hanging on like that black cat you know, who is just yeah. uh, soaking wet. Hang in there. Well, how long do you think she's going to hang in there for? <laughs> Pretty soon her claws are going to cut off. All right. Well, thank you again, Ken, for coming on the show. Uh, awesome. And we will see you next week, everybody else. Bye-bye. Sometimes it feels like the sun will never rise, like the birds will never sing. Uh.